Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 7. That's where we were up to last time. So let's just read again, verses 7, and we'll read down to, I think we'll read down to verse 10. So Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Notice that, not who believes the Bible, but who keeps the words of the prophecy. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I had seen and uh, had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your fellow prophets and with those who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. Let's just stop there for a moment. So, last time, if you remember, we looked at the three different aspects of prophecy. Do you remember that? We looked at the spiritual gift of prophecy. The Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you, gives you gifts which are prophetic. And then we looked at the ministry gift that's given by Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, the ministry gift of the uh, office or ministry of a prophet. They're not the same. And we looked at how some people mix that up. Uh, and then we said the most important one is the scroll of prophecy, the scriptures the Bible, God's Word, the book of prophecy. Some versions, the King James calls it a book, but it is more properly a scroll. And so we looked at the different aspects of prophecy and how you didn't get to, or you shouldn't mix them up. And sadly, we're living in an age where we make the spiritual gift of prophecy more important than the scroll of prophecy. You live, you, you've seen the charismatic world. People are trying to get uh, spiritual gifts of prophecy as though that's more important than this scroll, the book of prophecy, the scriptures. That's absurd. This is infallible. This prophecy is never going to change. This prophecy is all going to be fulfilled literally word for word. Jesus says, my words will never pass away. There's a lot of people running around giving spiritual prophecies through their charismatic gifts and they're almost acting as though that's infallible that's nonsense that's totally fallible because you're fallible and so we looked at that so i'll not uh, repeat this again but not just the prophetic aspect there's something that's mentioned several times there oh by the way you remember when i said when we got to the new heavens and the new earth everything wasn't in sevens it was in twelves you remember that? 144 and everything in 12s. We're now at the epilogue of Revelation. So it's not about looking at the new heavens and new earth again. It's bringing an epilogue to the conclusion. So it's back to sevens. There's no more 12s now for this last bit. So it mentions something there several times. I wonder who can notice it. Any ideas? says the same word several times. It's not the word prophecy. It is the word scrolls. Yeah? It says scroll several times. Now, in the epilogue, the final section of uh, chapter 22, how many times do you think it says the word scroll? Seven. Come on. Seven years and you've finally got the answer seven or twelve. Right, Seven times it literally says this word scroll. Now, the King James says book because um, that's probably how they may have thought this would have been translated back in uh, 1511 King James language, but it, it is the word scroll. Um, but it's, it's, it's a manuscript. It's writing on its text on uh, papyrus paper, as we would call it today. And so... What we're going to look at first is seven aspects of the scroll you've been given. You've been given a scroll, did you know that? Now you'd call it a book. You have been given the words of prophecy. You, all of you, all of you can have this book. 
There were, there, were, there were times where people couldn't have this. There were people who died so you could have this. People went to the gallows, were burned at the stake, so you could have this book. And God says he's given us this scroll, this word of prophecy, these written scriptures. And seven times there is a command attached to you with your scroll, this scroll. So, can we put up that? Uh, let's go to verse 7. I'll, I'll show you the first one, the obvious one. So, verse 7 says, this is Jesus talking. Look, behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. We looked at being blessed. So, first thing, you are to keep the word of prophecy in the scroll. Yeah? You are to keep it. Now, what does the word keep mean? If you're supposed to keep something, what does that mean? Does it mean you believe it? No. No, the devil believes Jesus is coming back. This word keep, uh, the Greek word tereo, it's sometimes translated uh, obey. Sometimes it's translated obey. Um, now, if you're given something to keep, what are you going to do with it? If I give you something and say, look, keep that for me, you've got a pretty serious obligation, haven't you, to look after it. I mean, you've got to put it somewhere safe. You, you, you're probably going to keep checking on it, aren't you? don't know if you've noticed anything really different about me tonight that you've never seen before. Can, does anyone know what it is? Glasses, I've had these glasses five years. I wear them all the time. I, I have got other pairs that I sometimes wear. No, it's not that. It shows how much you're paying attention. What did someone say there? I've got a wedding ring on. I, I am, I am, I, I am married. Um, I stopped where I hurt my finger and it swelled up and I couldn't get it on about 30 years ago. A long time ago, I don't know, 50, 20 years. Sometimes I wear it. And uh, I got asked politely tonight by someone if I would put it back on. She kept it safe, right? Can't lose it. Well, the best plain way not to lose it is to keep it on you. Yeah? Keep, not keep a Bible. You might own a Bible and you don't keep the words in it. No, keep the words... But not just the words of the Bible. The written words of prophecy. You've got to keep that. That means you've got to hold it close, hold on to it, look after it, make sure you keep checking on it, make sure you've really got it. Not just, oh, I think I've got a Bible somewhere, or I think I've read it, I think it might say this. One of the most frustrating things about teaching prophecy is people generally can't remember what you said last time. They can't keep it. When Jesus gave the parable of the seeds, he says it's the one who retain what the seed that retains and grows. Not the seed that was sown, that doesn't necessarily grow. Blessed are they who retain and persevere and keep. They're the ones who are fruitful. So, can we just go to that chart, please, Andrew? So, first one, then, on the chart, obviously, we've just said it. Keep the words of prophecy. Right? You've got to keep it. Guess how many times the word keep is mentioned in Revelation? Yes, it is seven. Seven times we're told to keep. Now, remember, it can mean obey. Um, we're told to keep this stuff seven times, but sometimes God says he'll keep. If we will keep stuff, God says he will keep you. Right? I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world. God will keep you safe. He knows how to look after you and keep you. But only if you keep him. Right? I'm going to keep my wife, but I've got to keep my wedding ring on. I've got to keep it or she might get upset. Okay? We're going to keep the words of prophecy. Right? It's a command. There's no excuse for not keeping it. We have been given it. Next one then, which is in verse 9, is keep again. Just for emphasis, so remember we're looking at, we're not looking at the word keep, that's mentioned in other parts of Revelation. We're looking at the, the seven times that the scroll is mentioned 
in the epilogue of the conclusion of Revelation. And so the scroll mentioned again there in, in verse 9, it's, it's associated with obeying. Can you just go to uh, Revelation 14, Andrew? Revelation 14 and verse 12. You've got to keep Revelation 14 and verse 12. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. You have got to keep his commands. And we're told his commands are not burdensome. He's not asking you to keep the Levitical law. He's not asking you to keep all the ceremonial food laws. But he is asking us to keep his commands that he's given to the church. The things he's, he's asked us to do. And keep faithful to Jesus. Right? Not faithful to church. Not faithful to religion. Not faithful to your system. Keep faithful to Jesus himself. Do not break faith with Jesus. I'm going to look at this in the next one. But how do you know you're faithful to Jesus? Well, you're not replacing him with other things. How do you know you're faithful to your wife? You're not replacing her with another woman or, or, or other things. So faithfulness to Jesus is linked to faithfulness to this scroll, faithfulness to his word. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. If you, if you love me and my word is in you, then you will be faithful. And elsewhere it tells us to be faithful to the testimony. Keep the testimony that Jesus has given you, right? Now, your testimony is not just saying you belong to Jesus. It's more than that. It's making sure you are a testimony to the world that you belong to Jesus. You don't get rid of that. Amen. Okay, go to Revelation 22 and verse 10 then. Revelation 22 and verse 10. So the next time the scroll is mentioned, he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. Now, one of the, one of the excuses that people give with not keeping this book is they say things like, well, I can't understand it. Why can't you understand it? It's not sealed anymore. It's unsealed. Remember, in the Old Testament, can we go here, please, Andrew? Go to Daniel 12, verse 8. Daniel 12 and verse 8. When Daniel had the same vision of the future that John was having, what does Daniel say? I heard Shema, but I did not understand. That's in the when when there's still a veil over what's happening. Christ hasn't come. The the the, the mysteries have not been revealed. The, the 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 new covenant has not been established. The Holy Spirit has not been poured out. All the stuff we have hadn't happened. Now Daniel heard but didn't understand. What did the angel say? Well, let's just read what Daniel says. He says, So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? Daniel had a vision of the end, an apocalypse, that John is having in Revelation, apocalypse, that he's giving to us. And Daniel's saying, I can't understand it. Now, we can look at that and think, well, if Daniel didn't understand it, what chance have we got? Because Daniel was the wisest man in the world at that time. He was over all the wise men, over all the, 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 the magi. And what did the angel say? He replied, Go your way, Daniel because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. They're rolled up in a scroll. So Daniel's told, well, you can't understand it, Daniel, because you, you're not in the new covenant. You remember when Jesus came, Jesus says, the, greatest in the, the least in the kingdom of God is better than those, John the Baptist and those of the old covenant. Why? Because it's not sealed to you. Jesus, at the beginning of Revelation, he opened the seals. The scrolls opened. Now, obviously, no one can understand everything, but you must not fall into the excuse that you don't understand something, so therefore you think you don't have to obey it. Well, I don't understand that. Well, look into it. God will give you understanding. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who is generous and gives to all without finding fault, James says. So 
if you don't understand something, ask God. Or are you saying you don't understand it because you don't want to do it and you've got a legitimate excuse because you've said you don't understand it, therefore you don't have to keep it? Some people do that all the time. I don't understand, so I'm not going to do it. Well, it's now unsealed. We are not in the Old Testament. We have seen Jesus. We've seen what he did. We've got the New Testament. We've got the scroll now unsealed. We've got the full descriptions of what's coming in the prophecies to come and everything's happening. So we can know. Doesn't mean we can know everything. But we can't use that as an excuse for not obeying what God has given us. Okay, can we go to Revelation 22 and verse 18? Revelation 22 and verse 18. So remember this scroll mentioned seven times in the epilogue. The epilogue's only a short. We're right at the end now of Revelation. So in verse 18, Jesus, the Lord himself, is saying, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. So in other words, once again, there is a warning that if you are hearing what God has said, you must not add anything to it. You must not add anything to the written prophecies that God has given us. Can we go back to the chart, please, Andrew? Because scroll mentioned twice there. So, so we've done looked at the keeps, we've looked that it's unsealed. The next one is what we've just read there. Anyone who hears now, you can't keep something you haven't heard. You can't understand something you haven't heard. But how do you know if if you've heard? Is this just me or do people get into trouble? Because they listened, but they didn't hear. I think the other day, Carolyn was going out. She said, make sure you put this in the oven in 15 minutes. And I went, yes, okay. And then she came in an hour later and I went, she went, did you put it in the oven? And I went, what? She says, I told you to put it in the oven. And you said, yes. I went, did I? But I'd not heard. She says, yes, you had. You said yes. And I said, no, I listened, but I didn't hear. I wasn't really hearing. Now, hear the words of prophecy. And all the women are laughing and all the men are like, screw. Must, must be regular. I, I think there's just too much to take in. So I have to filter what I'm trying to hear. Here, in the Bible, here doesn't just mean here as we think it means here. We think it means, oh, I heard that. That's not what it means. It's not. That's right, isn't it, Joseph? When, G when Jesus was says, what's the greatest command? Now, we're, we're to obey his commands in the written scripture. What did Jesus answer? He says, what's the greatest command? Jesus said... Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elokeinu, Adonai Achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's not a command, is it? Well, Jesus said it was. Hear, Shema. You've got to hear. But I've heard, no, you've just listened. It's gone in. But there's no Shema. It's a very powerful word in Hebrew. It, it's, it's, it's the same. It, it Literally, often, it means obey. So people would say, yeah, if, you, if you hadn't do something, they'd say you didn't Shema. You didn't hear. You didn't hear it. And that's why Jesus 
emphasises what's the greatest command. The greatest command is hearing in the first place because most people aren't hearing. They, they can say they know that, but they haven't heard it. They've not shmarred it and, and they've, not, they've not taken it in and that's why that let the churches hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Seven times in Revelation, that phrase is 14 times, two lots of seven. That's a lot of repetition in the whole New Testament. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But so what does it mean? Well, Jesus explains what it means when they asked him what the command was. So you've got the Shema Israel, but then he says, V'ahavta, V'ahav, and you shall love et Adonai, the Lord, Elohika, your God. It's not Elohim, that's God, it's Elohika, yours, your God. You, if you've heard, you will love the Lord your God because you will know he's yours. You won't just know he's a God, you, will know, you won't just know him as Elohim, you'll know him as Eloheka. he's your God who loves you. So if you're really smart, you'll love him. If you don't love him, you haven't heard, because I don't believe you can really hear who God is and not love him for it. Not if you've really heard. You can't do it. And this is why Jesus says this is the greatest command, because if you really hear it, you'll really do it. You'll know what it is. Your God. Your God. And then he said, how, how, do you, how, how is love expressed? How, how, how do you know you love God? Because you, you make call, you love him with all levavka, your heart. Be call means all, all that you have, your, 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 your levav, your heart. Uve call nisheka, all your soul. Your soul, the, the, your being, everything's God given you. It's a three part, it's a tripartite love. You love him with all your heart. You love him with all your soul, which includes your emotions and your will. And then Jesus said, remember he would have been, he says, Uve call me odeka. Now, me, me od is the Hebrew word. It means literally um, much. It's, it's with all your strength. It, it, they would still use that word today. If someone was sweeping, have you ever seen someone doing something, but they're doing a rubbish job? You know, you ask somebody to sweep up and they're like, or in Hebrew you'd say, me odd, very much strength, do it properly. Me odeka, it means, it means do it with all your strength as though you really mean it. Yeah? Men, has this ever happened to you? Let me use another illustration. Has your wife ever said, give me a kiss? What? No. Oh, okay. You're doing something wrong. We'll have a men's meeting next week and we need, I need to talk to you. Has your wife ever asked you to give her a... Yeah. You give your wife a kiss. Me and Lee. Yeah. Uh, some of you are lying because I've seen you kiss your wife, so you're not going to have Yeah. You've kissed your wife, and has this ever happened? You know what I'm going to say. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? She would say in Hebrew, Me'od. What was that? <laughs> Do it as though you mean it. Very muchness, strength, properly. Yeah, it's, it's a powerful word. Jesus says you love God, Me'odeka, you, you, with all your strength. You, as though you mean it, no, go on then, like Joseph shared this morning. Mind, by the way, that word levat, le, heart, it, it means more than we think means that. It means your mind, your, 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 your everything, your, your inner, inner being, really. All your inner organs, it's, you've got to do it. And if you don't, you haven't smart, you haven't really heard because if you've really heard, that will be your response. And that's what Jesus said. And that's why that's the famous prayer in the Bible. They call it the, the Shema. And there's three parts to it, because there's three parts to God. 
So you've got to love all three parts of God. You've got to love Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today we've got people who don't really quite like the Holy Spirit. Or we've got some people who love the Holy Spirit but don't love Jesus. They just go with anything that's spiritual. Now we've got to love all, all that God is for us. And and this is this is actually mentioned right at the beginning of Revelation in Revelation one three that we we're to hear and take to heart what God has given us. Okay, so go back to uh, well, I'll just bring the next one down because we did mention it. It's Revelation chapter eighteen again. In fact, bring the next one down as well because these two are like linked together. So we are told if anyone adds anything to God's holy scriptures, he will add to them the plagues in this book. And the plagues in this book are horrendous. So we don't add anything to it and we don't remove anything from it, which is the next verse, Revelation twenty-two nineteen. We don't remove any words of prophecy. Can I say that's happening all the time? They're not removing the words. They're removing the words of prophecy. They're saying it doesn't mean that. It does mean that. It means exactly what it says it means. But today you've got teachers, I can think of one famous teacher and all the academics love him. And when I listen to him talking about prophecy, all he seems to do is explain how what everyone believes is wrong. But I can't actually work out what he does believe. He just doesn't seem to believe any of it's really going to happen. I think of another really well-known British academic. He was leading evangelical, and when they asked him, what does it mean, because this was, you know, 70-odd years ago, what does it mean that Israel has now become a nation again? He says, oh, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a coincidence. Right, what, you don't believe that the Scriptures prophesied that? No, he, he didn't believe in prophecy. A lot of people like that around. So we can't add anything to it, and we can't remove anything from it. Now, before we start thinking, well, we would never do that, just hold on a minute. You know, I'm going to challenge you a bit. Adding or removing the words that God has given to us, it doesn't mean people go into the Bible necessarily and cut words out. It just means they bring out a different translation that misses out all the bits in that God wanted in. And that's happening all over the place. People are reading stuff, calling it a Bible and a translation, and it's not a Bible and it's not a translation. It's one man's opinion about his theological beliefs, which are not biblical. I was in a conversation with some pastors recently, Carolyn was with me, and I just made a joke about this this thing that's going around called the Mirror Bible. And uh, and I says, that's not a Bible, it's not a translation, and it's not a Bible. And, and they gasped, didn't they? And looked at me, and I goes, oh dear, have I said something that you didn't like? And they were all looking at each other going, well, we, we are all reading that in our Bible study group. It teaches universalism. It teaches that you don't need to be born again. It's one man's one man who was in the New Age and has now written his version of what he wants the Bible to say and you thinking it's God's word. It isn't. You've taken stuff out and you're putting stuff in. And there's the warning at the end of God's real Bible. I, bet, I don't know if he's put that in or not. But there's a warning at the end of the real Bible that you must not do that. God has given us the word. Now, there's lots of valid translations. I'm not knocking genuine translations done by academics and scholars who've researched the Hebrew and the Aramaic and the Greek and has given us translations and there's lots of very good, authentic, trustworthy translations. So obviously when you're translating into another language, it's not always precise. There's, there's thought for thought or there's word for word and they can sometimes have different angles on them. But a lot of these modern versions that are coming out, they are not translations. They're people just saying what they want the Bible to say. And Christians are lapping it up. Oh, isn't that nice? That speaks to me. Well, God's word is not about touching your emotions. It's truth. Yeah? 
a lot of people will say, well, and I've, I've had conversations with some people. I've said, you know, that's not really accurate, that, that book. It's a, it's a paraphrase. I'm not saying, I mean, some of them, the Living Bible, it's a paraphrase. That's okay. I think that's, you know, fair enough, as long as you know it's a paraphrase. But a lot of the new stuff coming out, I'm like, that's not even a paraphrase. That's just made up. And people say, yeah, well, it, it speaks to me. Well, do you know what? The Book of Mormon speaks to Mormons. And the Quran speaks to Muslims. And the Jehovah's Witness Bible speaks to Jehovah's Witness. But you shouldn't read it. It's not an ex. If you've, if you've ever talked to a Mormon, they'll say, I've got a burning in my bosom that this is the word of God. It's like, yeah, but someone invented it in the 1800s. It's nonsense. None of it's true. Archaeologically, academically, scientifically, it's just all made up. But they, they like it. We must not add to God's Bible, and this is what I'm going to look at tonight, in the next uh, 40 minutes. I'm going to try and just get us to see this, because it is very serious to ignore God's Word, or change it, or latch on to some teaching that isn't really in God's Word, and make that the primary thrust of what you think God's saying, when that isn't what he's saying. Most Christians in Britain don't even believe in prophecy. Do you know that? Most People who call themselves Christians in Britain do not believe in end-time prophecy. They've removed the words. And it, remember, it's the words of prophecy that Jesus is talking about. It's not love thy neighbour. They love that. But when Jesus is talking about, behold, I am coming soon, make sure you are doing what I've called you to do. Make sure you understand the signs of the times. There's people just saying, oh, I don't believe any of that. Oh, you've removed the words, words of you. Well, that means God's going to remove you. And you've added your own words. Well, that means the plagues are coming upon you. Surely you don't want that. It's very serious. Jesus said that the word, his words, he says, none of it will be changed. Not one yacht, what, not one tittle will be changed of his word till it is all fulfilled. He said this in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 4, 5 and 6. And then he closed his first sermon by saying, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is the wise man who built his house on the rock, the foundation on the rock. So the word of God is your foundation. You can't build anything if it's not built on the truth of what God has said. You cannot build anything in your life in a feeling that you receive from the Holy Spirit. Even if it was the Holy Spirit, you don't build on that. You build on the word, word and the Holy Spirit comes. You build the house on the word and the Holy Spirit inhabits the house. If you're not built on the word, the house falls down when the wind and the water comes. And the Holy Spirit is pictures of wind and water. Even the Holy Spirit will knock a house down if it's not built on his word. Because he comes to testify to the words of Jesus. Jesus told us that. He will take that which is mine and make it known to you. So we cannot change God's word. And so we have this Bible, this is my, I've had this Bible about 30 years. Anne bought me this from America. Got my name on it. Well, it did have its worn off now. As you can see, it's very tattered and worn. But this is my Bible. Still use it. I've got other Bibles, lots of other versions as well. But that's the one I've been using for 30 years. So what I wanted us to do tonight, I wanted to try and give you just some information um, that might help you, because this does get challenged an awful lot. Oh, by the way, there is another one up there, but we, we'll probably not look at that tonight. Is it, can you bring the next one up? It's linked to the rewards, the scroll. But we'll look at that next time, perhaps. So, what I want us to look at is... Have you all got a Bible? Have you got a phone? You've all got a Bible. You've got one at home. You have all got a Bible, haven't you? Yeah? You have got a Bible. It is a real one. You know, it's a King James, or it's an ESV, or an NIV, or a NASB, or an Amplified, or a New King James. It's a proper Bible, a proper translation. Good, good, good. Praise the Lord. I've achieved something tonight. The, the Christians have got Bibles. Right. Now... In today's society, especially over the past few years, there's been a massive attack on the Bible itself. You must have noticed this. You will have heard the arguments that you can't trust this, it was all written later. Jesus is a myth, it's not true. You must have heard those 
stories. A lot of academics say you can't trust anything in here. There's no, no scholarly or academic evidence that it's authentic or reliable or trustworthy. And so how do we know it is? If we've got to keep this, this book, if we're going to be judged about whether we keep it or not, is he reliable? Now, I know you all say yes, and I know that, I'm, but I want to try and help you get something by trying to give you some information. that Because you will get, I used to get questioned by this all the time. I can remember at work someone coming in, into my office, walking into my office. He were a nice guy, I'll not give his name. And he, he came into my office one day, this was like 20 years ago or so, and he goes, Dave, Dave, I've just watched the Da Vinci Code. It's not true. The Bible, it was all made up. It was made up by Constantine in the 4th century. And they just wrote it. And they made up what they wanted people to believe. And he made the Roman emperor made everyone believe it. And I went, you silly man. <laughs> I says, what are you talking about? I says, Dan Brown... Even atheists think he's, an, he's a fool. He talks utter drivel. But people believe this. The Da Vinci Code was the world's bestseller. People are lapping up this stuff. Is the Bible reliable? Right, let me, let me ask you a question. Can you get that next chart ready, Andrew? But let's go down one at a time again. How do we know it's reliable? Were you around when it was written? How do you know it wasn't made up? How, how do you know that, that, that people didn't invent it in the 4th century, that Romans didn't just invent this character like Jesus and he's just a mythical figure? How do you know that? Now, I know as a Christian, you know that because the Holy Spirit has come to you, you're born again, you've received Christ, you know your life's changed. I know that. But how do you answer people who come to you with these questions? Well, let me ask you a, a simple question. Okay, do you believe in the Roman Empire? Do you think it existed? Why? Because it did. Because I've been to Adrian's Wall. That might be a farm as well to keep his sheep in. I, I, you, you weren't around. I mean, I studied Roman archaeology. They, Adrian built it in 122 AD. I've been, I love going and looking at it and the archaeology, but how do you know? There's historical records. Is there? Are you sure? About Adrian's Well? There's historical records saying that Hadrian built Adrian's Well. Do you know there isn't? <laughs> but anyway, that's another issue. That, that you, we, we assume Adrian built it. We, that there is evidence towards that, but historical manuscripts? Really? Roman Empire. Have you heard of Julius Caesar? Yeah? Did he exist? Did the Roman Empire... I mean, he's, he's generally regarded as the first of the Roman emperors, the Caesars, although he wasn't technically a, a, an emperor. But we all know he invaded Britain in five, five, uh, 55 BC. He invaded Gaul. He won all the victories. He went to Rome to be proclaimed emperor, and, and they assassinated et tu Brutus, you know, Shakespeare wrote a play about him, and we we know the Roman Empire after that. After that, there was Mark Antony and Cleopatra. They fought Octavian, who became Augustus when Jesus was born. Caesar Augustus, that's the chronology. So we know that those battles and invasions and Julius Caesar, we know it all happened because we've got some documents that say it did. We've got something called Caesar's Gallic Walls. Do you know how many documents we have, how many manuscripts we actually have of that? Would anyone like to guess? Go down. Someone's seen this. Go down. Bring it down, Andrew. The chart. We've got ten. We've got ten manuscripts. Well, that's fine, because they were written at the time. No. They were written a thousand years after. No one doubts the Roman Empire existed. No one doubts Julius Caesar existed. 
no one doubts Britain was invaded or Gaul was conquered or he was assassinated and the next Caesars. No one doubts it. Ten copies, ten manuscripts we've, we've still got, we've found, which the earliest was written a thousand years after it happened. Now, how accurate is that? Right? Now, a thousand years ago, William the Conqueror invaded Britain. If I just started writing that now, a thousand, and it says, Dave says, here's what happened. How many of you would go, you weren't there? How do we, we can't trust what you've said. No one doubts the Roman Empire. No academic, no scholar, no one. We take it. We've only got 10 copies, 10 manuscripts still in existence. We know that the earliest of those is a thousand years after, but we all accept it. Okay. Has anyone heard of the Greek Empire? Anyone heard of Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world? Yeah? Now, we know about him through the writings of a Greek historian called Herodotus. I've read Herodotus. And after, I mean, he was hundreds of years BC, and... Uh, um, he, the Romans, who came later, called him the father of history. He's the guy who wrote the histories of the, the Greek empire and, and the Greek conquests. And so you will have heard about the stuff. You've heard of... Has anyone seen that film, 300, about the Spartans standing against... This is Sparta! In a Scottish accent. Because all the Spartans... All the Spartans were Scottish... Right, it was Herodotus. It was the Battle of Thermopylae. The Persians invaded. Xerxes invaded. 300 Spartans. It's not true, by the way. There were more than 300 of them, and there were lots of others, but that doesn't make a good movie. And so what happened is they stood against them at Thermopylae. How do we know any of that happened? Herodotus wrote it down. Father of history. A Greek historian. He wrote about... Have you heard of... Has anyone heard of Marathon? We run marathons today. Do you know why we do that? Because there was the Battle of Marathon where the Greeks won and the guy ran all the way, ran a marathon. That's where we get the word from, ran from marathon to tell the Greeks and then he dropped dead because it was too far to run. So people run it today. I don't know why because I'm sure it's really unhealthy for you, but apparently it's good. And so how do we know that even happened? Herodotus wrote it. Hundreds of years it happened before Christ. You know, Herodotus wrote all this down, you know, 400 BC, but even before that. Do you know how many manuscripts we have that tell us about that Greek history? Now, everyone believes that Greeks existed. We all believe those things. All academics do, they teach it. Do you know how many manuscripts we have? Bring it down. Eight the earliest of which was written 1,300 years after it happened. No one doubts it. We all accept it. Valid manuscripts. But they weren't written till 1,300 years after it happened. Yeah, but they copied the originals. What, after 1,300 years? Must have been a lot of copying. But no one doubts it. So, finally then... Has anyone heard of philosophy? Have you heard of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Pythagoras? You know, this is taught today. It's the basis of philosophical sciences that they are called, the Platonic methods. Plato was a Greek hundreds of years BC, uh, a Greek philosopher. He was a... Um, he was a student of Socrates, and one of his students was Aristotle. And so Plato wrote some documents on which uh, British universities have based entire academic schools on this information. Did they ever exist? Well, academia in, in many ways is built on this. The philosophical schools in universities, especially in, in previous generations, have been like the elite schools. We've got Dr. Mark at back. I'm, he, I know he studied some of this when, when he was doing his PhD. No one doubts it. 
Do you know how many copies we have of Plato's writing? Bring it down. Seven. The earliest of which was written 1,200 years after. So what I want us to see is when people tell you you can't trust the Bible because it was written much, much later and people just made it up, well, if you can't trust the Bible, can you trust anything that's happened? How do you trust something that's happened? How do you know a document's true? How do you know if you're real? Have you checked who wrote your birth certificate? Was it accurate? Was it signed the day you were born or was it signed a few days later? If you've lost your birth certificate, do you not exist? No, we know the Roman Empire existed. We know the Greek Empire existed. We know all these, these scientific methods and philosophies existed because they still exist. So if they hadn't existed, they wouldn't exist, would they? We know the Roman Empire existed because it carried on. How do we know the Bible's true? Well, we're here. So if it had not started and happened, we wouldn't be here, would we? There'd be no church. It would never have happened. So, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was on earth. Almost exactly 2,000 years when he went to the cross. How many manuscripts... Now, when I say manuscripts, please understand, I mean stuff that happened before printing was invented. Handwritten uh, papyrus or vellum or parchment. Obviously, since printing happened, they've duplicated. We've got millions, millions of books about everything. I'm talking about original manuscripts, documents, copies before printing was ever invented. Now, we, we believe all that stuff, okay? How many copies of manuscripts do you think we have just of the New... I'll not even mention the Old Testament. Just the New Testament. 2,000 years. Anyone like to guess how many we've got? 500. 1,000. Bring it down. We've got 24,000 ancient manuscripts. Not modern, this not modern, not nothing since the printing. And the earliest of these were written in the lifetime of the Apostolical Fathers, right? The copies that we have were in the lifetime of the people who knew the Apostles. And people say you can't trust the Bible. It is embarrassing how much information we have about the Bible. It's impossibly improbable, you could say it's miraculous, that we have got such a glut of manuscripts, handwritten, these are all handwritten, people copied it. If you piled them all up, you wouldn't be able to see the top. It's it's astonishing. It's the more you study it, the more you realise. My goodness, these early Christians loved their Bible. They made copies and copies, and their copies went all over the world. And we we find in them. By the way, I say twenty four thousand. It's actually nearer twenty five thousand now, because they're finding new ones all the time. Handwritten manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, ranging from right back to the first century, end of first century, right up to. Well, before the printing press was invented, because obviously then copying became uh, easy. So, if you don't believe the Bible, you don't believe anything. And it's academic suicide to say anything other than that. Because when people say, well, I can't trust the Bible, well, you can't trust anything then. You can't trust any study of any event in history, because the Bible is infinitely full of more documentation than anything else. Yeah? Pretty straightforward. And it comes from the time of the people who knew the apostles, the earliest ones. So, we've got the Bible. Now, even if that's true, that we've got 24,000 manuscripts, handwritten manuscripts, 
even if that fact is true, how do we know it's not got any errors in it? Because even if there's 24,000 manuscripts floating about, how do we know if there's no errors in it? Now, let me try and explain something. And this is where a lot of Christians get tripped up when they listen to these um, internet gurus who are explaining the faults in the Bible. These are all hand copied. If I asked you all to hand write the book of Revelation by hand on parchment with a quill and a pen in a hurry because the Romans are coming to kill you because what you're doing is a capital offence. How many of you think you would write it all out without making one error? Does anyone think they would write the entire book out without making one spelling mistake, one missed word, one wrong word, or one error? Do you think you'd be able to do that? No, you wouldn't. It would be That would be just silly to think that, wouldn't it? And this is where a lot of these people who say you can't trust the Bible because there's errors in it. Yes, you can't trust some of the manuscripts because there's errors in them. Of course there is. Think about it logically. If you've got 24,000 manuscripts, if one of those manuscripts is the book of John, and someone's copied all that out by hand, you don't think for a minute he's not going to make a mistake, do you? Stay with me now. I'm not saying, I'm not saying there's error in the Bible. I'm saying there's errors in copying it. There's no errors in what God said. I'm not saying that. But if you all copied word for word what I said tonight, you were writing down, dict if I was dictating, you were writing, up, I could guarantee 100 people here, there'd be at least one of you would put something down I didn't say. Or you'd spell something wrong. Or you'd do something that, you, you, you know, you'd, you'd duplicate a word. Or you'd miss a word out. Or perhaps you, you were looking at your phone, so you missed a sentence even. Possible, isn't it? Well, I would say it's more than possible. I would say that's certainly going to happen. So if that happened, and one person, say, say one person said, Pastor John's teaching a revelation were great tonight in the script. And then the other 99 said it were Pastor Dave. Would you say, well, you can't trust any of it then? Because one of them said it were Pastor John, and the others, 99, said it were Pastor Dave. Well, obviously the ones made a mistake when he's writing the pastor down. He's written Pastor John instead of Pastor Dave. Yeah, obviously, because the other 99 haven't made that mistake. The chances of you making the same mistake are, are actually improbable. You wouldn't all make that. I go guarantee a hundred of you writing down tonight's sermon, you would all make mistakes. But you wouldn't make the same mistakes. And so if you put all everybody's writings together, You'd see, yeah, he's made a mistake, but everybody else has said this. So we know that's a mistake. Yeah, he's missed a bit out, because when he was writing, he probably missed that bit or didn't copy that bit, but no one else has missed that out. And that's why when you look at your Bible, sometimes it will say, most manuscripts haven't got this, or some manuscripts have that. And they put the, they put the text in. They're just letting you know that there was a manuscript that missed that out, but the rest had this in. So, 24,000 manuscripts, there's going to be a few mistakes in each one. There's going to be a spelling mistake. There's going to be a word wrong. Of course there is. So how many errors are there in those 24 manuscripts? Thousands of them. Thousands and thousands and thousands of errors. Because there's thousands and thousands of manuscripts. So when these people say... In the manuscripts, there's thousands of errors in the Bible. Some Christians like go, oh, there's thousands of errors in the Bible. No, there aren't er errors in the Bible. There's errors in people's copies of some of manuscripts. Yeah, and, 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 and if you think about that, that's logical. 
And I actually take comfort in that because what we can do is we can gather the manuscripts together and we can look at it and experts do this and say, yeah, he has said that. But obviously that isn't what the original said because none of the others say that. He's written the wrong word or he's done the wrong thing. So when people, that there's one guy called Bart Ehrman who goes on and says there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of errors in all these manuscripts, he's, true, he's right. But what's he actually talking about? Is it, are, are, are these really errors? Are there errors in the Bible? No, I don't think there are errors in the, in the Bible. Now, scholars call these textual variants. So what it literally means is some manuscript have a textual variant to the other manuscripts. And so you have to compare to find, oh, he's made a spelling mistake, etc. So the main issue is spelling. Things are spelt differently. Now, remember, this is in a time where people have got several names and there's no one way of spelling a name. It's not like today where we've got conformity. I mean, how many would you write down Pastor Dave or Pastor David? Well, that's an error. It's not an error. It's just some of you have put David and some have put Dave. Well, they would do stuff like that. If you've read the Bible, you'll notice sometimes he's called Peter, sometimes he's called Simon, sometimes he's called Simon Peter... Sometimes it's called Kephas, which is a different way of saying Peter in another language. But it's all the same person. It's just they would sometimes write the name they knew him by, because that's what you'd do. Yeah? And one of the main errors is it's something called, I'll not bore you, I'm not going to technicality because you'll not be interested, but in Greek it's called the movable no. Right, let me give you an example of this. Who's intelligent? Right, Richard, you, you said not you, so I'll use you. Right, if I said repeat after me. Okay, let me think of... Um, a banana? A banana? No, no, wait, well, I've said all three. I'm going to say three things, yeah? Okay, okay. Right, right. A banana, a pear, and an apple. Yeah. Uh, what did I just say? Yeah, no, you didn't. You changed it. You just, you just, you just committed heresy. You just totally changed what I said. Did anyone notice what you said? Uh, yes. Who noticed what he said? Uh, I said a apple. You said an apple. Who's right? You are right, but that isn't what I said. Can you see now? It, what what's the difference? There is no difference. There's no difference. It's 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 like it's right. If you were writing, you wouldn't write a apple. You'd write an apple. Yeah. Why? Why would you write an instead of a? You didn't say an with all the others. So why did you say an for apple? What's the reason? Can you see? So we all do that. You would have, and especially when you're writing it down, you wouldn't write at apple, you'd add a n to it. That's what they did in Greek. But if you think about it, why do you do that? The only reason you do it, we think, is so that it doesn't sound weird by mixing your vowels. So you say, I a this, so you say an orange, not a orange. But it's not wrong to say a orange, is it? If you were talking, you wouldn't go, excuse me, I don't know what you mean. What, what do you mean, at orange? Do you mean an orange? It's like, what are you talking about? It's the same thing, right? The, the an's irrelevant. In a lot of languages, they don't even have these connected words anyway. So can you see, when you write it, you might, instead of writing it literally, you might say, oh, oh I, you'd write it like that. So you change it. Do you, do you know how, of, of those thousands of textual variants... 99.8% of that, it's not a change. But they don't tell you that. They'll just go in and say there's thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of errors. 99.8% of them are that. Yes, it is a difference in the manuscripts, but that's because the scribe writing it would prefer, he thinks that was the way you should have said it. Or it's a spelling mistake, or it's a... It's a, it's a name change, or it's a duplicate. A lot, 
Have you ever been copying something? You get to the end of a line and then you start again, but you copy the last word of the last line and you don't know you've done it. Have you ever done stuff like that? Well, they did because they copy their lines. If they do this by a candle in a cave so they don't get arrested. And and so somebody said, well, this word's in twice. Yeah, it's obviously he's, he's, he's made an error. He's made a duplication. It's not an error in the Bible. It's someone copying it, obviously duplicated a word. When we're saying the Bible's infallible, we're not saying someone copying it's infallible. But we're saying if we've got enough copies, we know what the original said. Because they wouldn't have all made the same mistake. Are you following me? Am I making sense? And sometimes there's, there's some stuff that's just obviously nonsense. Let me give you an example. Can you, can you go, Andrew, go, go, back, go back to the Scriptures. Go to 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. So Paul's writing to the Thessalonians. He says, instead, he's saying how they behaved among the... Th instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. Mm -hmm. Now, the manuscripts, that's what they say. There's one manuscript that instead of saying we were like young children, it says we were like hippos. Yeah, hippos. Hip hippos is actually the, hip, uh, the Greek word for horse. And so he's like, hold on a minute. Paul wasn't like a young child. He was like a hippo. He was like a horse. Was, none of the other manuscripts say that. They say children. Well, he'd obviously got his mind on the Grand National or something. He's obviously, as he's writing, he's, he's obviously just written the wrong word. It's what's called a nonsense variant. Obviously, yeah, he's written the wrong word. It doesn't even make sense. Obviously, he's not written that word purposely because it makes no sense. Right? It doesn't mean the Bible's wrong. It means it's one of these textual variants. So there's lots of things like that, scribal errors. That's not what we're talking about. What we really... So that's 99.8% of all, of all this stuff for the thousands. There are, however, one or two other variants that we do have to notice because it's not as easily explained it's probably easier to give you an example. Can we go to the Gospel of John, please, Andrew? Go to the Gospel of John, because we're looking at John's writing, so I'll stick to John. Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 3. So this is where Jesus heals the lame man who's laying at the pool of uh, Bethesda. You remember the story? So here a great number of people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who had been there, an invalid for 38 years. Just stop there. Could someone notice something about that? What have you noticed? There's what? Oh, no, it's not that. That's just probably the computer not spelling right. Can anyone tell me an obvious mistake there? It doesn't, something doesn't look right. Stop reading the words and look at the numbers. There's a verse missing. Yeah? Verse 3, and then it goes verse 5. Where's verse 4? Oh, they took it out of the Bible. You can't read these modern versions. They took a verse out. They haven't taken a verse out. Can you go to the King James? Just flip it into the King James, Andrew. Verse 3 in the King James. So, there lay a great multitude of important folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Next down. Oh, verse 4 has now appeared. The King James has put it in. For an angel went down at certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever went first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made all of whatsoever disease he had. Then he carries on. So, why have modern versions taken that verse out and the King James had it in? Because the King James was translated from manuscripts called the Textus Receptus. And what that was, 
was one of the people writing one of the early manuscripts of John put that in to show to the readers it's what you'd call an editor's note. Now, who put it in, we don't know. It could have been one of the original people say no they just need to know what it doesn't explain why they're laying there by the pool so should it be in or shouldn't it be in now some people will say oh king james is the authentic one because it doesn't take out verses of the bible modern versions don't take out verses of the bible they're just sticking to the 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 testimony of the majority text and most manuscripts don't have that verse in now, if you've got a good Bible, a study Bible, it will have that verse in, in italics. And it will say, some manuscripts say this. But scholars are almost certainly sure this was an edit. This was something someone added just because they, they thought John's Gospel didn't explain it properly. Now, it may that may be legitimate. I'm quite happy with it being in. doesn't affect anything. It's only a comment. Was it in the original? I don't know. It may have been. It may have been out. The pre I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect anything. It has no theological uh, meaning. It just gives you information as to what that explains why they were there. doesn't mean the Bible's been changed. Remember, all the manuscripts are handwritten. If someone makes an edit, you won't know because it's just another piece of writing and next to another. And, and, and the script in Greek is written in what's called block unseals, which are capital letters. It's not like written in another person's handwriting. So if they put that in, you wouldn't know if it was in originally or whether it was added later. You'd only know by comparing the other manuscripts. Now, some people jump on these things and say, this is proof we don't know what the Bible says. Nonsense, of course we know what the Bible says. It's just that sometimes, and we'd only to, remember, we're only talking about less than 1% of the variants. It is sometimes stuff like that. And so modern versions, because they're not limited to the manuscripts, they can look at these 24,000, they can try and stick to a little more accuracy. I've actually, let me give you an example. I wrote a book called The Coming Bride. Now, those of you who were here 12 years ago when I wrote this book, I rushed an early copy out and get and printed it and gave it out to people. And then when I travelled to America, I took a copy and I read it and I realised there were lots of mistakes in it. So I edited it and I put new information in. I, I even put a whole new chapter in and then printed it again. Now, when they dig up my manuscript in a thousand years' time and they find both copies... Which one is the real Dave? Both. I've made an edit. No, that proves Dave's not infallible. Because if Dave had really written it, Dave wouldn't need to change it, would he? Yes, I would. Because thought, as I wanted to put some more information in it. Doesn't mean it's wrong, does it? It just means I made an edit. And sometimes, in the, you, I, if you've ever read Mark's Gospel, have you noticed at the end of Mark's Gospel, there's two endings? And it says, Jesus rose from the grave and the women went from the tomb and told, told people. And then it says, after Jesus. And it's, it looks like someone's added a bit extra because it looks like um, it was a bit of an abrupt ending. But what's added is information from the other Gospels. So it's not wrong. It says they went and preached the Gospels and they spoke in tongues and they were bit by snakes and it wouldn't harm them. So we know that happens because we've read Acts and we've read about speaking in tongues in the, in the other manuscripts. So there's nothing added that affects anything, but just bear that in mind. Okay, so let's move this along because I can see some of you are getting bored. Okay, if all that's true, how do we know? Even though it was written early... Most of the manuscripts are from the people who were after the apostles, or even later than that. How do we know that it wasn't changed between the time of the apostles and that 50-year gap afterwards? How do we know that? Well, can you put up that first picture, please, Andrew? Right, can you see that? You see that? 
That is called P52, because they, they make a note of all the manuscripts. Now, let me, just, let me just explain something. Throughout the 1800s in theological colleges all over the world, but especially in Germany, they taught what was called higher criticism, textual criticism, where they would say the Gospels were written 100, 200 years after Jesus because, um, and they linked on to this, they said John's writing was too advanced. The early Christians did not have that understanding, especially of Christ and his deity, and so you can't rely on it as truth because this is their philosophical ideas that were added later and put into the Bible. And they taught this in the in the colleges in the 1800s, and all the textbooks said, basically, yeah, it's a bit of a myth. They rewrote this myth about Jesus, but their understanding, you remember when John says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and they said they, the early Christians wouldn't have understood that, that understanding of, of who Jesus was and God. And so they said John was written ar around 200 AD. So it wasn't written by John. And this is what was accepted in universities and theological colleges. This was generally accepted as true, that John was written about 200 years later. In 1935, a British uh, man was rummaging through some scraps of paper and he found this in a chest. And this was in a time, 1930s, or an academic, so he could read it. And he thought, that's Greek, unseal, capital letters, Greek. And because it was a time of biblical literacy, it probably wouldn't happen today, no one would know what it meant. He recognised it. He thought, this is, from the, this is from the Gospel of John. And so he read it and he compared it. He goes, yeah, this is, this is from the Gospel of John. And so... Um, they went, by the way, you can still see this in uh, the Rylands Library Museum at uh, Manchester University. I, uh, I've i been and looked at it because I like stuff like this and I've got a, I got a card with it on. This is about actually the, the size. Now, it's not much, is it? It's just seven lines and it's uh, it's written on the front and the back. So one's the back image and what's the one's the the front image of this piece of papyrus, this manuscript called, called P52. And so they recognised it was from John's Gospel. Well, no problem, they've got lots of manuscripts from John's Gospel. So they sent it away to be uh, properly scientifically dated. The papyrus, the ink, the writing style, they can work out when it was written. It came back, the first date was 1895. John was still alive. John was still alive. And this is a copy. So they were already copying John's writings while he was still alive. Now, uh, another day came in and said around 100 and the other one was a decade after that. But whichever way, they were copying John's gospel and his writings right back at the beginning, and we can prove that. Now, here's the other wonderful thing about this. It's only a little parchment. It's only a, a, a small piece of papyrus. Sorry, not parchment. It's just this small part, but it's written on both sides. So what? Well, have you ever done a jigsaw? A while ago, they brought out some jigsaws. They were called the Impossible Jigsaws. And the reason they were impossible is it had a picture on one side and then it had the same picture on the other side. What's impossible about that? Well, you don't know which side you're dealing with because if you get it the wrong way around, it won't fix. It'll be a mirror image of the other. So you, you almost can't do the jigsaw because it won't fit. It's written on both sides. So what that means is we can fill in the blanks from the other manuscripts and if there's a word added, the other side won't match. The words will be in the wrong place. Can you follow me? And if a word's taken out, it won't line up. The words will be in the wrong place. Because we know this is from John's Gospel, chapter 18. It's in John's Gospel, chapter 18, uh, verse 31 to 38. Just go to it, Andrew. 
John chapter 18. Now remember they said the Bible's not true because John's not true because this John couldn't have had this knowledge of truth until at least 200 AD. Go to verse 36. This is what that says, this papyrus, the Rylands papyrus. Jesus answers, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then go into the uh, NIV. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. And then these are the last two verses of that papyrus. Pilate says, you are a king then. Jesus answers, yes, you say I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. I think God has got a sense of humour. They were saying, we can prove this is not true. And then the experts say, well, we can prove it is true. And the, the actual text says, Jesus is truth. The bit, of the, the bit of the Bible that says that, bit of John's gospel. So we've got that. The jigsaw puzzle goes together. So we know it was written way back in the time of the, the disciples of the apostles and the people who knew them and who knew the eyewitnesses. So we know that from bits of papyrus. Go back to the, the pictures then, Andrew. We'll just go through these. I'll just show you these. Just pretend you're interested because I know I'm a bit of a geek and I do like these things. Go to the next one. So this one's P66. Now that's a codex. That's a book, not a scroll. Can you see the papers all frayed and there are different pages behind it? I know it's not a very good picture, but once again... There we've got John's Gospel from 100 AD, between 100 and 150 AD. So the lifetime of the people who knew the apostles, they've already got copies of it in book form. So they've already copied it. And once again, John's Gospel, as you know, begins. Now, one of the main things that they said, they, inv they invented Jesus' deity. They, they believed in Jesus, but Jesus wasn't God. I remember one man one, in my office once saying that to me. He says, well, I believe in Jesus, but Jesus never said he was God. And they didn't believe he was God. Really? Well, this is from the time of the people who knew Jesus. And knew the, well, knew the apostles, definitely. And it's John's Gospel, chapter 1. And it's the book of John. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And they said that right back at the beginning. So when people say they believed in Jesus but didn't believe he was God, that's utter nonsense. We've got the textual manuscripts to say he was, and they believed he was, and they worshipped him as God. So to say that he was invented later is nonsense. It's not true. It's just not true. So Dan Brown's telling lies. Yeah? Dan Brown, Dan Brown basically, basically says that what happened is that the Council of Nicaea when Constantine got all the churches together, they got 318 bishops, pastors, leaders together, and Constantine called them all together because Christianity had been illegal. So they couldn't compile whole Bibles. It was against the law. He says, right, let's all get together and decide what, what the Christians really believe. Let's codify it. And they're going to write the first complete Bibles instead of just all the different manuscripts. And so they had to, at the Council of Nicaea, now, you'll hear people say, like Dan Brown says, it, by the way, Muslims believe this, that they invented the Trinity and the Bible. They invented it at the Council of Nicaea. It's nonsense. They didn't even talk about uh, what the Bible was at Nicaea. They already believed what it was. We've got the evidence. But there was a debate over the deity of Jesus because there was a guy called Arian, and he taught that Jesus wasn't God. And he was, he'd been expelled from Alexandria by Alexander the bishop there and so they and he came to the council is and so they had a vote on it and this is where Dan Brown comes in because he says oh they had a vote on whether Jesus was God and it and it only just passed out of the 318 people church leaders there 316 said he was God the two Arians there who didn't believe it said he wasn't, and they kicked them out, and they tore up their writings. In fact, have you heard of a guy called St. Nicholas? Father Christmas, Santa Claus. Yeah, it's, that's, who it's, that's who it comes. It was it, it, one of these councils. Arian got up and said Jesus wasn't God. Santa Claus, St. Nick, 
Father Christmas went over and slapped him in the face. How dare you say our Saviour's not God? Get lost. And they, they kicked him out, excommunicated with him. So all they were doing were affirming the deity of Christ. They weren't making it up. We've got the evidence. The manuscripts say that Jesus was God. By the way, Arian, Arian, the Arian teaching, do you know where they went when they were expelled? They went, do you know where they went? Germany. Does Arianism ring a bell? By the way, Arianism is basically what the Jehovah's Witnesses would teach. That Jesus was, yeah, but he wasn't God. And there they take out the definite article all the way through their scriptures. They take it out. Yeah? Right at the beginning, Jesus is God. Next one then, let's move through these. That's uh, the earliest copy of the book of Revelation. Remember the jigsaw analogy once again? put the bits of revelation together and so we can see once again that the book of course one of the one of the arguments was revelation was never in the original canon of scripture that's not true we've got one of the earliest mentions of what were the genuine scriptures it's called the muratorium fragment and uh, revelations in that as the authenticated documents of the bible and it says there were four gospels and all the books are in there there's there's, there's three three or four missing i think i think it's Peter and Jude and Hebrews, but he wouldn't have had copies of those. That red arrow there, that's pointing to the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13. Um, and so Revelation was written way back in the 100. They already had copies and were copying it way back, way back then. And one of the other arguments they then said is, yeah, but it wasn't written by John. It was written by someone else who didn't know Jesus. Well, the Muratorium Fragment doesn't call it Revelation. It calls it the Apocalypse of John. So they thought it was John that wrote it. And Irenaeus and other people who knew Polycarp and the Apostle John, they said it was John. So it was John. And some people just don't want to include it. Go to Revelation then, Andrew. Let's go back to the book of Revelation. Go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, go to verse 19. So, just because God's word is infallible, because it's inspired, because it's perfect, doesn't mean if someone copies out by hand, they aren't going to make mistakes. Of course they are. It would be impossible to copy the Bible out without making mistakes. That doesn't mean there's mistakes in the Bible. And some of these mistakes we're well aware of. But once someone likes the way something sounds it's very hard to get them to change it very hard because that that phrase is stuck in their head right can you see that can you go into the going to the king james andrew so here's what we've been looking at taking things away from the book of life king james if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So if you take away anything of God's word of prophecy, he will take away your name or your part out of the book of life. Yeah? Can you just go into the NIV, Andrew? Or, yeah, could go into any of the modern versions. If anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life. Well, King James said book of life. And this version says tree of life. So which one's right? Of course, a book and a tree aren't the same thing, are they? So which one's right? There's an error in the Bible. There isn't an error in the Bible. The King James Bible was written from the manuscripts called the Textus Receptus, the received text. And the first Greek translation of that was written by a man called Desiderius Erasmus in Basel, Switzerland. And he wrote the first copy of the Greek New Testament as a manuscript because this was in 1516 as the Protestant Reformation was starting and the printing press had been. So his publisher said, get the Greek manuscript compiled 
so that we can print it. And there was a deadline to work to, because if they didn't, someone else would beat them to it and they'd lose all the money. Now, Erasmus was a good guy. He was a, he was a good reformer. And so he did it all, and he got to the book of Revelation. He got to the last chapter. He got to the last few lines of the last chapter of Revelation, and his manuscript had the verses missing. Now, remember, they'd already got Bibles, but he was doing a compilation on the, man the manuscripts of the Greek to try and get a Greek, complete Greek text. So what does he do? His publisher says, you've got to have this done immediately or we're going to lose the money by not printing it. And so what he did, this is, he's a scholar, he had a copy of the Bible, but it was in Latin. Got a, he got copies of the Vulgate. So for the last, last few verses, and literally, I only mean four or five verses, he translated the Latin back into Greek, right? And put that in his manuscript. No problem. It still says the same thing. But anyone who knows about translations, you can't do that. Because you're going to end up with words or phrases that no one's ever seen before. And so he translated it back from the Latin into the Greek, verse 19. Now, the Latin word for book, we, we still use it today, a library. It's Libra. But... But, but the word for tree is ligna. And he mixed them up. And so he wrote a Greek version of the New Testament that said book instead of tree. Now, is that wrong? No, because if you remember the, the, in Revelation, God does say he will take away their name from the book of life. So it is an accurate theological statement, but it is an error. It says tree, not book. And that's why modern versions will say, no, here he's talking about tree. It does talk about remove, and this is probably why he didn't even know he'd made the mistake, because God does say he'll take you out of the book of life in other parts of the, the book. So can you see, someone making an error doesn't mean the Bible's wrong, as long as we can acknowledge that. If we, if we fail to acknowledge that sometimes people making handwritten copies have made errors, then we might be in trouble because people do make errors. Okay, then, let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Just go back to the next picture, Andrew. Uh, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd, I'd throw that one up to you again just as proof. That's P72. Um, that's uh, Peter's writings, and Peter starts his... Um, his introduction. This is from the hundreds. There's also some right from the hundreds AD. And it starts by saying, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's very clear that right back at the beginning, they worship Jesus as God. And we've got manuscripts that say they haven't been changed. It's the same as it is now. Next one then, Andrew. Um, that is Codex Sinaiticus. So once it wasn't illegal to be a Christian, they compiled Bibles and put them in codex. That is in the, uh, that's in the British Library. You can go and see that. That is the oldest complete Bible in the world, oldest complete New Testament in the world. And you can go and look at that. That's from the 300s AD. And you'll notice how neat and, and good it is compared to the other manuscripts because now Constantine paid for new Bibles to be written and the church now could read the Bibles. Now, if all those manuscripts and that Bible and all these documents were burned and we didn't have any of them, how accurate would your Bible be? It would still be 100% accurate. Wouldn't it? I mean, we wouldn't want to lose them all. But even if we lost all 24,000 ancient manuscripts, it wouldn't make any difference because now... Since the printing press, it's all been authenticated, verified, and printed. And so now you have God's word that you don't need to worry about. Okay, then. Final point. I've only been talking about the New Testament. If you just go down to the next slide, final one, and then we'll close. The Old Testament issue was solved and sorted 
a long time ago. Well, not that long ago, actually. The Old Testament, some of the Old Testament manuscripts, they were the, the ones that we had were thousand, a thousand years since it was originally written. The, 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 the scroll of Isaiah in the Masoretic texts was a thousand years after the fall of Jerusalem. And people used to say, you can't trust Isaiah. All the prophecies were added later. 1948, in those caves there, that, I think that's one of the first times I went when I'd still got some hair. And I've still got some muscles by the look of it. That's the caves of Qumran that they found it in. And that's that next photo. That is the original jar that they found the scroll in. And that there is a photo. Fo now, I weren't allowed to take photos of these, but Carolyn broke the law by taking a photo of you in the museum. Um that's the original Isaiah scroll. It's 24 feet long and it's a complete copy of the scroll of Isaiah. And it is from almost two and a half thousand years ago. Just think about that. And so they could compare over a thousand years from it, from the, the next manuscript we had, and they could compare by looking at it all because it's totally complete. There's a few airs in it and rips in it, missing words, but they could compare it with the modern text that we had and guess what? It was the same. Were there any textual variants? Yeah, there was, it was handwritten. There were a few textual variants, but nothing that affected anything. We have no manuscripts that affect any theological doctrine whatsoever. They're all minor textual variants. And so we know the Old Testament. That was settled a long time ago. By the way, when did you know when they found that? The greatest archaeological discovery of the authentication of the reliability reliability of the Bible and the nation of Israel. They found it in 1948. The day Israel was reborn, they found the proof. Now they're digging up all the artifacts and it's verifying in the city of David and other places the archaeological proof. It's all true. It was all written down. Nothing's changed. Everything we know is true. So, you have the scroll. You've got it. Can't be taken from you. No one can take God's words from you. Even if they burn the Bibles, you've got it in your heart. No one can take the truth of God's love for you away from you. Jesus says his words will never pass away. We've got copies of this. Let's value it. Let's not add to it. Let's not take away from it. Let's not reduce it to just versions we like because they're easier to read. Let's study God's true word so that we can live as God wants us to live. Amen.